First of all, I want Chris to tell Pearson. you, a lot of people have, not a lot, but some people, have said to me, well, since you started LDRs, you're the father of that power rock trick, and I am not, okay? <laughs> uh, if anyone deserves that title, it's this gentleman, Herb Wake. He was yeah. the founder of Rocket Development Corporation and creator of the Energet 8 rocket motor. And uh, interesting little tidbit about Herb, who's still alive, by the way, living in a retirement home in Indiana. And uh, he and George Ruse and John Raconan all worked together in Five Hall together, uh, making, you know, you know, solid propellant. And George Ruse went on to form FSI, and, uh, and John Raconan, of course, started Prodigy. Um, so, so you see, you know, just like, you know, other people like Gary himself, who worked at a professional rocket company, went on to form a, you know, model rocket company. So, uh, now, to, to a lesser extent, also Lee Peaster could mm -hmm. be considered one of the fathers of high-power rocketry because he understood from the beginning that there were models out there that wanted to fly more than sea motors, okay? And, um, so, uh, and we'll get to him uh, more later on. Secondly, I did not in, in, invent the term LDRS, okay? That term was invented by this man, Roger Johnson, and this was taken at Smoke Creek in 1981. Uh, and uh, he, I overheard him say, we're going to fly some large and dangerous rocket ships. And that just, I said, wow, that sounds great. That just stuck with me. Now, Chuck Piper from the Rocket Research Institute claims that prior to that, they were calling their the stuff that they flew out at Smoke Creek large and dangerous steel rocket ships. Okay, so that I don't know. I mean, that's that's what he says. And, and Roger may have heard that and just changed it. Okay. Now, are there any, before we even start, is there any specific things that any guys want me to talk about? Or do you have any questions or or anything like that? No, I didn't get thrown out of the NAR for flying G motors and uh, you know and stuff like that. And, and yeah, I, I told I told Pat Miller to, to go f himself a couple times, but uh, you know, uh, but no, I mean it's, uh, 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 So if anyone doesn't have anything specific, you know, yeah, we'll get to that. Um, Coaster. Uh, well, we're going to get to that. Okay, yeah. that fact that's next. All right. Now, uh, this is a picture from the second edition of the Hamburg Model Rocket. Okay, these are. Early high power model rockets, <coughs> probably flown with coaster motors, okay, ENF black powder motors, but they were still limited to the, the one pound weight limit. Now, this is paraphrasing, of course, thou should not fly more than four ounces, more than 80 newton seconds, that was added later, and then, or more than one pound. And this was the, the law since the beginning, all right, since the beginning, since Harry started the hobby with Orville. <coughs> and, uh, uh, yes. This was an FE limitation. Yeah. Well, this is when they when the, when the hobby started. This is what they were saddled with. Okay. So now I have a little bit written here that I'm, I'm not going to read from the script. As unbelievable as it may seem today, at one time flying anything over an F motor was forbidden by the NAR. Members were expelled from the organization for flying so-called illegal motors, which was once called amateur rocketry, has been redefined and is now called EX or research rocketry and is regulated by Tripoli. However, amateur rocketry was alive and well and flying below the NARS radar decades before it became mainstream in the 90s, okay? Now, here we go, Coaster, okay? Coaster made a uh, large black motor, EF and G motors, okay, which were certified by the NAR. Okay, if you look in the first edition of the handbook, there they are. They were NARS certified. Well, we flew Coaster motors in 9 4 in 1962. Yeah, well, they were they were around for a long time. So uh, now Lee, who's shown here with you <coughs> and Bill, okay, uh, was had enough forethought to understand that, like I said before, people wanted to fly more than a C motor, which was all that Estes was providing at the at the time. So he bought the technology from Coaster and basically, you know, shut Coaster down, and those turned into Minimax. All right, uh, Minimax. You know, uh, end burning motors and the their port burning motors. Okay, and um, they were they were they were nice. All right, unfortunately, you had to have them delivered to you by rail yep. because uh, of the the size of the of the um, uh, the black powder in them. I mean, they they had to go down to the to the rail yard and pick them up. Okay, that was a major major pain. Even the D's, which were yeah. were large. Okay, the, you had to get those. So. 
And that in this, they don't even, they don't even have the D's in, in this one. This must have been a later one, but they did have uh, D motors available, okay? Now, of course, then comes Irv Waite and his Energet, okay? <coughs> now, this was from the late 60s, okay? okay. And as I, as I said, Irv was a rocket, a real professional rocket scientist, and he just downsized the motors, all right? And, but you see here, so do I have a laser? Is it showing? Okay. Uh, anyway, um, he, he did more than just the Energy 8. He had a whole series of motors because he was a professional rocket scientist and he made motors for the industry. Okay. The Energy 8 was just the hobby part of it. So, well, Lee saw that pretty much the black powder motors had reached their limits. They really couldn't move much farther with them. They were dangerous. They were having problems with them. So he went and he bought the technology from Energy. And, and basically shut, I mean RDC, shut them down, and those became the Enerjet rocket motors that you saw that came out about 1969. So, now, um, uh, and they were, you know, E and Fs, and they, they made other motors too. They made, you know, bigger motors than that. And, uh, but those, those just weren't available to the rocketeers. Now, how many of you remember this? Yeah. Okay. Still waiting for it. All right. I had a friend who had one. All right. He put it in some minimum diameter thing and never saw it again. All right. I, I, call, it, I call him the idiot of the decade. Right. It's probably the most collectible motor you can have. Okay. And, uh, and, and he flew it away. Okay. Even if he had a dead case, it would have been worth some money. All right. So I remember seeing this advertisement dollar twenty each for a, D, right, for a composite D motor. Wow. All right. Well, that was a lot back in 1970. So 24 millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was 18. 18. No, no. It was, oh yeah. No. Yeah. You're right. It was 18 millimeter. Yeah. Because they called they called this the uh, they had a term for they had the uh, different just poundages. I think they called this the Energet Four. Okay. But but for our purposes, it was called the Energet E21. Right. Now, uh, Energet had big plans for the their product line, okay? Mm -hmm. This was the 26570 rocket system that they were offering for sale, but they didn't tell you that those three motors were G72s, okay? That's what it was supposed to fly with. That's how you could get it up to two miles, all right? <laughs> so, um, and this is a picture of one of them at NARAM 16. It had three F100s in it, okay? It wasn't powered by three Energets at the time, because by then Energet was gone, all right? This would, this would have been 1974, and uh, uh, you really don't. You really can't see that. But this person here is John Sickert. No, that's Mark. No, Levine. pardon? Mark Levine there. No, that's this is Chuck Munn yeah. here. No, no, that's another no. I thought that was Chuck Munn, and this was. Uh, that's Moose. That's Moose. Yeah. And, okay. and Fred Schechter's off the. Oh, I thought, that was, I thought this was Fred. Yeah. No. Okay. Fred, Fred is the other guy. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's Bob Del Principe there. Yeah, that's a, a Bob Del Principe. That's a name that may bring back memories. An old Centurion employee. All right. Uh, anyway, another company that was around at the time was Product, and that was John Raccoon's company. And he made a very interesting uh, bunch of black powder motors. They were in plastic cases with ceramic nozzles, but they were black powder. All right. He also made composite motors for anyone you want. Okay. This was an information sheet from 1965. All right, where he would offer you to sell to you, the, uh, for some reason he had a real fixation with the weather because all his motors had, there was hurricane, cyclone, typhoon, yeah. tornado, yeah. okay, all right. The typhoon motor was one by seven and a half inches and the tornado motor was 2.77 by 24, okay. <laughs> but, but he would go one step further, he would make whatever propellant you wanted for it, you know, with whatever size you wanted. So this was EX rocketry in 1965, all right, basically. So that's, that's probably John right there. John, of course, passed away a few years ago or something. Um, he also worked at Thai Call up until the time he retired. Right? And of course, we all remember flight systems. We know and love flight systems, OK? Um, that was originally George Roos's company. was bought by Harold Reese and taken over by Lonnie and later Larry. And a lot of people don't know this, but they, they actually made composite motors too. They just never sold them to the, to the Rocketeer public. This was the one that they were going to sell, their G60. They just never got the propellant certified. Uh, at uh, Mark 75, Lonnie Reese and Doug Pratt came to the Toledo uh, Regional Contest at Mark 75, and they flew those Thunderbolts. 
Mm -hmm. I had one in my hand. They, I, had, I had those in my collection too. They sold them at Pitcom. They were selling them kind of like under the table. Okay, I know a number of people that had them. Now, this is these are examples of three different sizes. The small one was the one that they were supposed to sell commercially. Okay, and and then there were uh, the other one was like a, it was a G. I don't know the designation, but it looks like a G and an H motor basically. And that, of course, that big one is like 17 inches long. So. Uh, there were some of those in the truck that we saw. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had I had some of those at one time. Oh, cool. Okay. Now, just to show you that all the old rocketeers weren't sticks in the mud, okay, uh, or party poopers. This is Orville Carlisle, the man on the right, with a high-powered stick rock at, <laughs> at a pyrotechnic skill convention, okay, because he was big. He was really big into pyrotechnics, okay. That's Randy Subs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, and it was his motor, but. Right. So anyway, um, yeah. So uh, so you know, he, Orville had fun too. So um, so now now before while this was all going on before LDRS, there was Smoke Creek. Okay, uh, it's a it's a name that probably doesn't mean much to most of you people. Smoke Creek probably it ended in '83. The launches in Smoke Creek ended in '83. Okay. Uh, you may see in some of these people, in some of these pictures, you may see people with disguises on, right? That's because they were NAR members, all right, who didn't want to be identified as being in an amateur illegal rocket launch, all right? And now, this gentleman is, is, that, is posing with an all-metal vehicle with zinc sulfur in it, okay? All right, this is, this is the type of stuff that they flew out there in the 70s, in the, in the, in the 70s, okay? Where's Smoke Creek, Chris? It's, uh, it's, you know where Black Rock is? Well, I mean, it's, it's well, in Nevada. It's it's a, it's about a hundred miles from Reno, from north north northeast from Reno. Okay, um, you go to Fernley and you go straight north past Pyramid Lake. And Nevada go, is all I was looking for. If you go to the left, <coughs> if you go to the left, that's Smoke Creek. If you go to the right, that's Black Rock. Okay, Black Rock, of course, is where the Burning Man is, and everyone probably knows what that is. Okay, and this is the rocket taking off. I'm not sure if this is that exact rocket taking off, but Zinc Sulfur has an ISP of about 60. Okay. And if, if you know anything about the propellant, you know, uh, characteristics, black powder is about 90. And <coughs> think about zinc sulfur is about half the fuel is burned after it is expended from the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, about half the time the rocket just blows up on the pad. All right. And, uh, and, 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 and that's just a spectacular. Okay. Uh, of course, we're a half a mile away from these things. Okay. And the thing is, none of them had recovery systems. They were just, it was ballistic impact. So it just came right on in. So, um, yeah. now, of course, sometimes you can see that's, that's the shovel recovery, that's how it came in. Now, now, George James was one of the guys behind all this. He founded the Glendale Rocket Society, the Reaction Research Society, and eventually the Rocket Research Institute, RRI, which was the last one that was out there. And they actually began flying at Smoke Creek in 1967. So this is amateur rocketry as defined by the NAR, you know, metal vehicles with um, uh, you know, in, in with real propellant in it. This wasn't Homer Hickam putting match, match heads into a CO2 cylinder, okay? These are real, real professionals doing this type of thing. Um, and you can see, like, some of them were so heavy. This is a conventional rocket over here, okay? Just a conventional model rocket. This was later on. And, but they're so heavy that, you know, they would need a winch to, to put them on the pads, okay? Because they're steel, all right? They're not aluminum like, you know, some of the stuff we have today. Uh, they were they were steel with, you know, and they were really heavy. So, um, like this is an example of two stage rocket using Galsite 63. Galsite 63 is an ammonium perchlorate asphalt propellant. Okay, and uh, it's it's pourable. All right, you heat it up and, and it's pourable. So um, now in 19, uh, that's that's just one example. And, they, and, it, and it just wasn't they were just weren't doing it for fun. They were actually trying to do real science. Okay. And that's the liftoff of that rocket. You see, they were a mile away from it when it took off, right? So they were, they were really safety conscious. And this is a three-stage of pretty much the same design using the, the Galsite 63. Uh, and uh, now, now this, is the, this is a picture of the Helix 2, and this is very interesting, okay? Um, in, in 1979, uh, RRI allowed non-NAR type rockets to be flown there. Okay, with either homemade motors or clusters of commercially available motors. 
And this is a picture of the Helix 2. Now, now this is the one that, that you, you were pictured with, right, Gary? Uh, or is that Helix 1? I was with Helix 1. Okay, all right. Well, I mean, I was in both of them, but yeah. All right. Well, uh, I, I think I have a picture of Helix 1 here somewhere. But in the early days, they called high power rocketry, it was called MRT, or model rocket technology. And what that was, was high power motors, or high power rockets, as defined at the time as high power, which today we would probably call mid power. And, but they were made with model rocket components, all right? Because that's all we had available, all right? Uh, the Helix, well, the first Helix <laughs> flew with a cluster of 80 F40 motors, <laughs> okay? And I don't know how many this had. I don't remember. So, um, a lot. <laughs> also, in, in 1981, um, uh, they, uh, they started to allow um, Dr. Leroy Keyes from Oregon would bring his high school class down there, and they pretty much transferred the, the rocket technology program to Chuck Piper at RRI, and they would come out, they would build metal vehicles during the year, and they would come out in, this was over Memorial Day, they would come out and fly them, they were zinc sulfur, the AP motors, and uh, that, was, that was actually a high school credit class that these guys were taking, all right, and they would come down and they would fly their rockets. So, and that's, you can see where it says on top, but you may be able to see it, it says MRT, or MRT, yeah, my rocket technology. So, and it also says Aerotech on it. So, <laughs> so but, uh, okay, uh, now, yeah, all right, here's, this is the Helix one, okay? And Roger Johnson, once again, and there's Gary, you can't see him very well, Corey Klein, and the, the remains of the Helix one, which <coughs> the, the ADF 40 motors, composite dynamics have 40 motors in it, okay? Now, now, at BlackRock today, the metal rockets look a lot better, okay? All right, this is an example of something that flew this past year at, at, uh, at BlackRock. Uh, Eight-inch diameter motor, you know, all metal. It was aluminum, all right, no steel, okay? Aluminum and fiberglass, uh, but it's still metal nevertheless. And here's a picture of me with uh, my obsidian, all aluminum rocket, at balls, all right? I have this in my room if anyone wants to see it, all right? So, uh, um, now, also at Smoke Creek, there were companies like Plasma Jet. All right, Plasma Jet was run by Randy Sobsek and John Krell at Smoke Creek. All right, they would come out and they would sell motors that they made. And um, now, back in the day, uh, Plasma Jet, ProJet, SSRS, you know, that was small rocket, small sounding rocket systems, which later became Crown right. Rocket Technology. All right, they were, they made. Uh, the first so-called illegal high-power motors, and what I mean by illegal is that they just weren't certified by the NAR. So the NAR called anything that they want that they didn't certify as illegal amateur rocket motors. Okay, um, and they, they made the stuff that I flew back in the pre-LDRS days. All right, many of these motors were made on the West Coast and regularly flown in places like Mill <coughs> Creek. While they all eventually had NAR-certified motors, plasma jet, SSRS, FSI, composite dynamics, Enerjet, and even SDs made uncertified motors in the G to I range, which they flew regularly, okay? Um, the la the la one of the last NARAMs I went to was the one in Vegas, and they were flying SD's composite G motors that Mike Dorfler made, okay? Uh, unfortunately, neither of them didn't work really well, but, uh, but, but anyway, anything like this, okay, or well, this is also what, you know, pla this was one of their sales brochures, plasma jet sales brochures, all right? And you see up here, you can't really read it real well because red is the worst, Color you can have. It says motors over 80 newton seconds are not currently NAR certified, so check the laws in your areas on model rocketry. Okay, so they knew it. Okay, but they didn't care. So uh, now these are some plasma jet motors. You know, an F, a G, a mid H, a full H. Just examples. A lot of the guys. They, the reason why they stuck with this 29 millimeter format was because that, they got the tubing from FSI. Okay, and that tubing is just like this. It's just a convolutely wound phenolic. All right, and uh, nothing really special to it, but they got a good deal on it, so that's why they were using it. So, now, once again, like I said, the NAR considered this is illegal amateur rocket, okay? And of course, uh, that's a no-no, okay? And like I said before, if, if they knew that you were doing this, they would expel you. They were, you, you would have a disciplinary hearing and you could be expelled from <coughs> the organization, all right? Um, now, getting to some more uh, sedate things. All right, this is Lucerne. This is Gary Rosenfield with his three-stage mini center rocket, Lucerne, right, like uh, hippie hair at all. All right, 
and uh, three stage F-52s in each stage with a mini Cinerac uh, that he had on there. Uh, fuse ignition on all three stages. So Electrically initiated. Electrically initiated, yes, but it had fuse, fuse ignition. So now, uh, the man on the right is John Davis, who uh, went out with Gary, went on to form Composite Dynamics, and this is them uh, test, testing one of their, their motors. You may remember the, the old Composite Dynamics catalog from, the, from way back when. They made one kit, okay, and, and just, you know, E20 and, and uh, F40 motors, and they came out with the first end burning composite motor, the, the, the E9, uh, which was uh, 29 millimeters, opposed to all their other motors, which were 24. So, and of course, there's the, the I think that's the first Aerotech catalog. You now, you know, Gary, Gary left Composite Dynamics, and after a while, created Aerotech. Uh, and now, getting to LDRs, we're up to LDRs one now, okay? Now, this is the announcement that went into the Model Rocketeer, all right, the, the top one was the first announcement that went into the Model Rocketeer on the uh, May 82 con calendar, okay? And of course we didn't tell them what LDR stood for, all right? Well, one night I get a, I get a phone call from Krista Barros, who's the editor of the Model Rocketeer, very upset at me, asking me what's going on. So I, I tell him, slams down the phone on me in the next month, the, the one on the bottom, all right? The LDR's one previously occurring in this space, has been determined to include intentional amateur activity. Not announced in the original notice. And our members are urged not to participate in LDRS1. Okay? Pat tried every which way to shut us down. He wanted he wanted to send me a list of all NAR members so I could cross-check on the applicants to make sure no NAR members were flying. He called up people and he basically wanted them to rat on anyone that was there. They all refused. Okay, it never happened. What year, what year was LDRS1? 85? 82. LDRs one through five were held in Medina, Ohio. Actually, in Malik Crate, but we, we said Medina. Uh, and after that, it went to Hartzell and, and, and other places. So, this is my first high power rocket, and it's a typical MRT. <coughs> it was two pieces of SD's BT 101, a V2 nose cone, balsa wood fins covered with silk span, not even through the wall, with a 29 millimeter motor mount in it. Okay? And, uh, uh, and I, I'm not sure when, this may have been taken in LDRS1, I don't think so, but uh, uh, it was probably years before that, so. Anyway, um, the, like I said, the, so guys are basically taking SD's parts and, and, and parts like that and building high power rockets as it existed at the time. That was before companies like Ace Rockets came out with the thicker wall body tubes, and they were pretty much the first ones to do that, and US Rockets, did it too, all right. Uh, I myself uh, took, took all the SD's maxi brutes, put 29 millimeter motor mounts in and reinforced them, took the Century Super Kits, which were meant to fly with the Super C engine, okay, and put a 24 millimeter mount in it so I could fly it with composite dynamics, compo uh, composite motors. And a lot of guys did that for a long time. That's what we had to, to, to do, okay. So, now, this is, this is a fun quote that I remember Reading, I read the, the, the Handbook of Model Rocketry for the first time in 1968, it was the second edition, and this quote just stuck with <coughs> me, okay? I don't recommend, recommend clustering high power for large model rocket engines. You don't need that much boost. If you do, think you do, you don't have a good design, okay? That's, that's right from Harry, okay? So, uh, now the thing about it is, is, is that um, the, as, as soon as they invented rocket motors, Guys were trying to cram as many in a tube as possible mm -hmm. to fly it. I mean, that's quite obvious, okay? All right, now, and it, it goes on today, okay? That here, one me. here is Harry, okay? Right. Posing proudly with his Honest Ivan 7 cluster right, that's right. rocket, okay? This is also from the second edition of the handbook, okay? All right, now, this is back in 1967, 68, okay? Now, now, of course, at LDRS, we go to the, the most ridiculous far extreme, okay? And we have Scott Pierce's 169 motor cluster at LDRS-1. It's 168 A32s and 1C63 for the ejection, okay? Right. And the next year, he came out with a 450 cluster, but it failed. It did it crash, okay? And that was even more spectacular. Flash in the pan ignition, okay? And they all cooked, okay? All the kernels popped. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. So that flew successfully. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, but I would give you there's a chart something like that flying. Okay. Oh so that was on the cover of uh, one of the uh, ah. or high power rocketry. So that, I got the cover further on. So now early early high power rockets uh, used clusters of D12s, E60s, F100s, whatever we had available. All right, this is a replica 2250, the North Coast rocketry sold, flying on three D12-7s, okay? Uh, this is a picture of my mongrel. We flew it out there, it's one of three F100s, all right? And uh, flew fine, all right? Um, and this is the highlight of LDRS-1, okay? Mark Weber's rocket, which flew on a single composite I motor and two F7s for smoke and delay. Because the, <laughs> the, 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 the composite I motor was made by RDC, all right? He, he had made some motors up specially for, for Mark, and it, uh, he pr pretty much used just straight 80-20 AP and binder. He had no metals in, in a lot of his propellants. Okay, so it was it was flameless and virtually smokeless. So and of course there was no delays on them or ejection charges. So that's what the F7s were for. Right? They were for tracking smoke and for delayed ejection. So now um, and here's Gary and, and Corey Klein at LDRs too. LDRs LDRs became uh, in later years a place where the manufacturers would come and debut their products, their new products, motors and, and kits and everything like that, and would test fly a lot of them. Okay, and uh, is that, am, I, am I over already? There are 26 no. minutes. Okay, all right, sorry. <coughs> and um, the, uh, uh, so they would come out to LDRS and like, uh, like Corey and, and Gary and all the other kit manufacturers, US Rockets, Jerry Irvine would come out and uh, uh, you know, everyone would come to LDRs just to, to fly the products and debut them. Uh, we flew many of the first motors that were made by many of the manufacturers at LDRS one or at one of the LDRSs. I, I just need to remember, you know, the first J100s, the Aerotech J100s being flown, and and, uh, and stuff like that. So, um, uh, so it, you know, it, if, if you saw that stuff, it was it was very memorable. Okay, um, <coughs> now. Uh, now, so we, now we're going to talk about some of the publications that were that were available at the time, okay? And uh, there were there were a couple, okay. California Rocketry was probably the first one. California Rocketry was more of a magazine, not so much to promote Rocketry in general, but it just as a, a, a vehicle for for Jerry Irvine's selling Jerry Irvine's products, okay? But at the time, it was an influential magazine. It really was, okay? And no one can deny that. And at the time, he actually had. Uh, he was actually an important person. I mean, a lot of people don't like to, to admit that, but he was an important voice in the hobby, and, uh, and he did a lot of good things way back in the beginning, but unfortunately, you know, what he's done since then hasn't been so great, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the things I forgot to talk about the, uh, the motors was that, uh, I'm gonna read this, is that, er Early high power flyers in Lucerne had uh, local experimental uh, composite motor makers like Projet, Plasma Jet, and later Composite Dynamics that made motors. Professional commercial motor companies like RDC that made the original Enerjet motors and Vulcan Systems also made mo hobby motors, as they called them, or hobby motors were made to order. So you could uh, get in touch with them, and if you'd give them enough money, they would make you rocket motors and make you experimental rocket motors. All right. These motors were unavailable to the average rocketeer, and you had to know somebody, all right, to, to get them, okay? At LDRS-1, custom 38mm h and composite motors from RDC were flown. At later events, prototype motors from Aerotech and Vulcan systems were flown. And like I said, LDRS became the showplace where new products were debuted. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, the, the magazines, okay, the two of the magazines. And uh, like I said, California rocketry was important at the time. Uh, I forget. I can't remember exactly when he started and, and ceased publishing, but um, uh, but you can still get them. Okay, he still got them. So um, now the other one uh, that was good big at the time, High Power Research. Uh, this was actually uh, from uh, 
in this area, the guy, the guy that made it, um, he's, what is his name? Mike Nelson. Mike Nelson, yeah. Uh, lived in Cincinnati. He was part of the Cincinnati High Power Contingent, which was, uh, you know, uh, Mark Weber and J.P. O'Connor and a bunch of people from down there, a bunch of people from Kentucky. And he ran a print shop, you know, like a, like a postal instant press, you know, PIP or something like that. <laughs> And so he decided to produce a, uh, a rock tree magazine, high power rock tree magazine. And uh, it's not in color here, but it was it was later issues. It was full color. And uh, but basically, it was what it became was not so much a uh, magazine for national coverage of high power events, but basically what Mike Nelson took to the latest launches and flew, and who he thought was important and who wasn't, you know, and. Um, uh, he had some good articles, he had some good issues, some good photo coverage. Um, uh, he went three or four years publishing it, and uh, he just never, uh, uh, I guess he got tired of it, or uh, just ceased publishing. He was going to come out with one big issue, one big final issue, he never did. So, uh, now of course the Tripolitan came out, once Tripoli was founded, um, the Tripolitan came out, and uh, that was, of course, uh, the, the magazine from Tripoli, right? And it eventually evolved into a full color uh, magazine, as you see, well, full color cover, and later on it became full co color, uh, and, uh, which then evolved into High Power Rock Tree, and there, of course, is the picture of the uh, Scott Pearson's rocket taking off, all right, and uh, on the cover. He reprinted the LDRS-1 article, which was originally printed in Snore News uh, way back when, which, by the way, got a lot of people in trouble because every pic person that was pictured in that article that was a NAR member got contacted, all right, and, and about possible disciplinary action being taken against them. So, um, but they, he printed it in uh, High Power Rock Tree. Uh, in this case, the colors, the pictures were in color instead of black and white. And he also printed a lot more photos than were actually in the, actual, the original article. So it was much, much bigger. This, uh, and actually that article's been reprinted several times. And, uh, and also a, a, a updated version of it, which I call the LDRS story, which was basically the history of LDRS from the, before to, uh, you know, the end of LDRS-5. Uh, LDRS-5 was the last uh, launch that we had in Medina, the last high power launch we had in Medina. Actually, we had one launch after that, but what happened was uh, we were flying uh, on, the, on a, a, a private airfield that belonged to one of our members' families. And uh, they eventually, after LDRS-5, we were told that they were going to lease the property for farming. Okay? And we weren't able to, we did one more launch in the fall there, excuse me, and after that we never flew there again. After LDRS-5, LDRS-6 was held in Hartzell, Colorado. Six and seven were there. It's gone back there a couple times, and ever since then it's bounced around different places in the country. Um, the place where it's been the most is Argonia and Kansas. Uh, it was in Hartzell three or four times. Uh, it's going to be back in Lucerne this year for the third time. Um, Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina, you know, here and there. Uh, it's never going to go back to Medina. People ask me, are you ever going to have another LDRS back in Medina? No, it, it was small. It was too small for LDRS-1, okay? <laughs> really, you know? And I actually went back there a few years ago. I drove down Station Road, which was a, the corner of Station and Spieth Roads is where, where LDRS was on a field on this, you know, private airstrip. And further down Station Road, there's a bunch of McMansions that grew up back in the 90s. And, but the area around the field is still pretty much farmland. It's being farmed, there were crops on it. Where we flew was mowed flat. So it was, <coughs> they were using it as an airstrip again, and that windsock was up. So someone is flying there again. But I don't know if the Wagners still own it. Okay. Yeah, Wagners still own it. They Wagner's do? Wagners still own it, and Mike's son lives in the house. Oh, he does? So okay. still own it, yeah. Mark Canape actually went up and knocked on their door one time, uh, like a year or two ago. And they, they looked at him like he was an alien from outer space, okay? They didn't know what he was talking about. So, because uh, uh, he, he went there, and I actually have a picture on the, the Notro website that I took, all right, from the corner looking southeast. And you can see the one rocket eating tree, all right? And uh, 
uh, but it's the field looks better than it did when we flew. Okay, so uh, and but it's we can never we can never go back there. So um, you know the uh, and then of course we have more news. That was a magazine that uh, I was part of uh, back in the eighties. This is that store news is where we printed the the LDRS coverage from year to year, and uh, uh, even though it was just it was supposedly like a section newsletter, it really wasn't. We sent copies all over the country. We had about a subscription rate of about 200, and a lot of a lot of people read that magazine. It was kind of infamous. Okay, uh, Matt Steele and I got called on the carpet one time for an article we printed uh, about Harry, and uh, we had to go we had to go to Chicago and appear in front of the board and and. Uh, and Say mea culpa, you know, and everything like that, and all is forgiven. So, um, so uh, now, high power rocketry can pretty much be boiled down into two things: early kit companies, okay, and early motor companies, okay. And a lot of these, unless you've been around for a long time, a lot of these may not be really uh, familiar to you, okay. But we'll go through some of them. Uh, if anyone else can, you know, I've got another slide too. But if you if you know of a company that isn't on here, you know, shout it out, okay? But uh, now I'm doing. I put them on there pretty much in so, so in order of sales. So okay? Rock R and D is not from this. I, this is only up to about 1980, or maybe 1990. All right, early high power. I consider pretty much my. So what was what was Rock R and D? Oh, that was. Um, that was about the time they came around. He made a few kits. Maybe, maybe 1990. I remember them being at, at Danville's in the 90s, yeah. but I don't remember him before that. Okay. So. Uh, what about Cortis? Who? Cortis. Cor oh, Cortis? Cor no, Cortis. They did some fiberglass kits, didn't they? Matt, do you remember? Yeah, like, that was later. a little bit later, too. That was later? Yeah. Okay. Wasn't there one Tiffany Hobbies? Or yeah, or Floyd. Floyd. Oh, that yeah. was That was Floyd. later. That, that, that was one with Cluster R and. And all those kind of cluster arms on the next slide, but but uh, anyway, so doing it in order of pretty much of sales. I'm sorry, Gary Aerotech isn't in here because you weren't yeah. doing it in the '80s. Okay, um, Lock Precision, of course, is you know the, the, the big one. Okay, uh, public missiles, North Coast rocketry, U.S. rockets, Ace rockets, small rocket sounding systems, which later became Crown Rocket Technology. He did sell kits, very few. Right. But his kits were made by the same guy that from Astrodynamics, okay, which later became Eagle Aerosystems. Okay. Dynacom, of course, was the first fiberglass kit company. Okay. Dare, uh, Coltris, Thoy, you know, Tiffany Hobbies of Ypsilanti, Cluster R, California Rock Tree. He made California Rock Tree was a rocket company before it was a magazine. They made one kit. Okay. And Composite Dynamics, which also only made one kit. All right. So uh, I don't have on here, I don't have Stargate Rocket Systems because even though he produced prototypes, he never went into production with any of his kits. He had some nice kits too. Um, so, uh, but a lot of these companies produced, you know, only were in production for a few years. Um, and I always said that, you know, everyone wants to own a rocket company, and but, uh, and you, you know, you think you're going to make make a lot of money at it, and then after about five years, you realize that, you know, the only thing you have to show for it is a is a basement full of paper tubes and you've been working for 25 cents an hour, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and so after, after that, they figured, oh, I'm gonna get out of it, you know? So, now, uh, talking about early high-power motor companies, of course, Coaster, of course, being <coughs> a big uh, black powder motor company, Prodyne, John Raconin's company, Centuri Minimax, which was, of course, Coaster, Flight Systems, uh, you know, the, the Roos and the Reeses with their, uh, their black powder motors. Supposedly, Flight Systems is gonna come back. Yeah. Okay. They've been. They were at uh, Narum last year or two years ago. Uh, the last one in Colorado Springs, and um, they were showing product. Well, actually, they were showing old product. They have a website, but they have no product available, and it's been that way pretty much since they started. They claim that they're going to start making motors again, all right, black powder motors, and they, they they showed me some tooling, but whether or not that actually happens, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Rock Development Corporation, which of course was Earthweights, uh, uh, Enerjet, Estes, the big one, the big boy, okay. Uh, like I said, they were making composite motors. They've, they've tried, you know, Mike Dorfler, uh, who just passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, 
uh, was really big, ended up trying to you know, make composite motors and get them to uh, uh, produce them. Several times Estes announced before North, they were the acquisition of North Coast, all right, that they were going to produce composite rocket motors. Mm -hmm. They just never did. All right. um, Century Energet, of course. Uh, Century Energet was only around for about three years. All right. And uh, of course, when Estes and Century were sold to Damon in 71, Energet went away. Because I, I probably Energet probably never made any money. And uh, um, uh, it was more of a, you know, and of course, um, Lee was, you know, he had very, very big plans. He was going to produce a whole range of rocket motors, not just the little, you know, uh, hobby motors for sounding rockets. And like I, you saw the picture of the Energet 2650, he was going to come out with a uh, sounding rocket lines. What was the other one? The 1320? The 1340. Energet 1340, which was a smaller one. Uh, that was another kit, and you can get that from them. Uh, they had it for sale. Uh, it just never came to fruition. I think he overestimated the high power market, much like the, the guy that, that had Eagle Aero Systems uh, did the same thing. He thought, he, he actually, you know, had an office and everything like that, and a secretary, and a staff, and he sent out like 500 catalogs and got like 25 orders. You know, well, you're not going to survive on 25 orders. And so that, that he only lasted about a year. So um, he just overestimated the, the early high power market, just as, as Lee did. Okay, um, I think maybe the fact is that he had too much professional competition from guys like Irv, who was still around, and guys like Verkonen, who was still around, uh, right, producing you know, motors for uh, just about anyone that wanted them. So uh, Projet, of course, which was Gary Rosenfield's you know first high power motor company, Plasma Jet. Uh, from Randy, and he's still around, but he's not into rocketry anymore. Uh, SSRS, of course, Crown Rocket Technology. Uh, other ones, Composite Dynamics, Aerotech ISP, of course, North Coast Rocketry. We sold rebranded Aerotech motors, and we also sold Whirlwind motors, which were made by RDC. It was the first smoking composite motor. Uh, 29 millimeter, it was, yeah, 29 millimeter. It was like an E24 or something like that. Uh, it was notoriously hard to ignite, okay? Uh, Vulcan Systems. Uh, he made, you know, you name it, he made it uh, up until, you know, some years ago. Uh, he doesn't want to have anything to do with hobby motors anymore, as he calls them. So don't even think about calling him and asking him, hey, you got any motors left? Okay. Um, he, uh, he, he actually, Vulcan was actually purchased and bought out by another company. And, uh, and he's just subcontracting for them. He's getting ready to retire anyway. R3, which was Renault Rocket Research, or Centerjet, which they became Centerjet. Uh, Propulsion Industries, and, and Synergen and Propulsion Industries are both Ohio companies, in fact, Cleveland, northern Ohio companies in the Cleveland area. Uh, Rocket Flight, which of course well, came out with the large black powder motors uh, and the uh, Silver Streak motors, the, the first black powder Sparky motors that were available. And uh, uh, RTI Reaction Labs, another Ohio company, that was Mark Weber and his crew. Uh, Reaction was called Reaction Technology Incorporated, and later Reaction Labs, and of course, U.S. rockets too. Okay, produced produced motors. He still claims to produce motors, but he really does. <coughs> so, um, is there? Do we have any questions? I mean, is there any questions about anything? Did you mention uh, Cosden? You know, pardon? Did you mention Cosden? Cosden was '90s. Okay. Uh, you know, you know, one company I forgot to put on here was Copter. You remember Copter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Did I had some of those. They were terrible. <laughs> so, I remember I remember Synerjet being up at the Danville launch. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he, he he had his own local system that he was marketing with snap rings, but he also had single use motors. And single use motors basically was him sitting out there at a table at the launch. Yeah. And okay, I want I, you know if you come up there and I want a 29 millimeter eye. Okay, pulls an aluminum tube out. Get some slugs, throw them in there for you, throw a snap ring and a nozzle in this end, what lay you need? I need about 12. About all right, snap ring, here you go, $29. <laughs> that was how you did yeah. yeah. manufacturing. He came that. out with reloadables, I think up to 38 millimeter. Yeah. And, but his, he had a, uh, he didn't have a 20, uh, 29 millimeter, he had a one inch, it was a real bastard size. And he sold a paper to to put over it to fit inside. No, he had an eye. I flew an eye. I had an I-275. I flew in a seven motor cluster. And it was a 29 millimeter loom case. It went right into PML. Really? Well, all right. Well, later. He, all right. Maybe that was later. He also sold 
he, he gave me a prototype 54 millimeter uh, like J motor to fly, and it worked fine. But he never produced them. Okay. I remember your stuff being pretty reliable. I didn't see many. Yeah, yeah I, I certified on one of his H motors at yeah. the second Danville launch. And, yeah, yeah he, it was a pre-made motor, but he cut the delay down to whatever. He was the first guy to trim delays. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I had one of his delay tools. I still know, do. From way back when. So. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really clever design. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, but but he once again he was uh, he uh, I think what happened was that he. He used up the original batch of AP that he had, and when he bought new stuff, which he got from me, okay, uh, and when he bought the new stuff and made the propellant with it, the characteristics were completely different, and all the motors were blowing up, <coughs> right? And that's that's when he, he kind of gave up, okay? He just said, I'm not going to do this anymore. So, uh, but that happens a lot. I mean, you probably hear a lot about motor manufacturing, about about some guy's going to come out with a new motor line or something like that. And uh, uh, Ron, you never pronounce his name. Urensco. Urensco, yeah. And AP, uh, APS. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, advertised in the magazine and did a big blowout and you never saw him. And I was always hearing about, oh, this guy up in Oregon is going to make motors or this guy down in Florida is going to make motors. And uh, there, was a motor, there was a company called Energon yeah. okay, that, that, that certified one motor. Like an L1000 or something like that, you never heard from them again. Okay, uh, wasn't that part of Mr. Ed? So, so they, they, they come and go. I mean, motor manufacturers come and go, just like kit manufacturers come and go. And uh, uh, so, you know, so if, if, you, if you see something that's really good now, grab it because it may not be here next month. Okay, so especially motors. If you're if you're a motor collector or something like that, or a kit collector, it's always good to grab things as soon as you can because um, you never know how how much longer they're going to be on the market. So. Does, uh, anyone else have any questions or comments? I'm not running out of time here. So, anyone? So, well, thank you.